Come one, come all to see this summer's must-see cinematic experience. Grab your popcorn and soda pop to enjoy this magical musical adventure straight from the distant lands of the Far East. Talking animals for the kiddies, romance for the dolls in the house, and of course, graphic cartoon violence for the fellas too. Ha! <laughs> Fun for the whole family. Of course, before we begin, the following picture may contain language not fully appropriate for younger audiences. We try our best to keep it clean, but you never know with these rapscallions. Also, there will be spoilers for Panda and the Magic Serpent, so if spoilers for a 60-year-old feature bug you, there's the door. And as always, the opinions expressed are those of the individuals and not necessarily those of the theater as a whole. And now, sit back and enjoy our feature presentation. <laughs> Hello, one and all, and welcome to Dub Talk, the premier anime podcast where we talk about dubs new and old, good and bad. And tonight, we have something very, very old. Yes, we have decided to try something a little bit different as a sub-series for this podcast. So, uh, if you're a connoisseur of anime dubs, you're probably familiar with productions that have been made in the 2000s, 2010s, or now we're even into the 2020s. But I got a couple of my buddies here. And we have decided we're tired of covering just those stuff here because there's so much more wonderful, forgotten, old material out there in the world of anime dubbing that nobody remembers. And we've decided to finally take a look at that. So, we are kicking off a brand new subseries called Dub Talk Retro. That's right, we have decided that the, for this subseries, we are only covering dubs for things that are so old that none of us were even born when the material it was dubbed actually came out. God help us all. Anyways, say hello everyone who is here tonight. Hello. Hi folks, you, uh, you picked a time to come in here and listen to our episode. <laughs> Can't wait to see the pandas! <laughs> A panda, so cute! A koala, Who's driving? so cute! Oh my god, panda's driving! How can that be? <laughs> Remember, folks, panda is not a panda. Little JJK reference there. <laughs> so, if you've heard the fine uh, folks here tonight, uh, my name is Noah Clue, animation aficionado, and I have assembled uh, other members of the Dub Talk podcast who are also into the older material here. So, I first of all, I called in a library historian expert. Please say hello, I'm on duel. Hi, you'll hear a lot of fun facts these this episode. Most of them are things I looked up. That he was, and he was a big help on this because uh, where do you even look up stuff like this? The great the great thing about old dubs is that no one who worked on them is alive by and large. <laughs> and we no one cared have, to write anything about even, them at the that's time. Not true. That's not true. Uh, some... Most of the actresses who were in this are still alive, I thought. Aren't no, that's allow, true. Allow, allow, me, allow me to restate that. No one, no one has written a lot about this one movie that was the only movie ever put out by this studio. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, yeah, to, to back up what Amon said, and Black said too, is that a lot of the, the actors may still be alive, but a lot of the production people uh, who actually made this happen unfortunately didn't. That's how long ago this was dubbed. Uh, speaking of lack, I also brought in a old school dub expert. In fact, he's the only person I have ever talked to who prefers the streamlined dub of Akira over the Bang Zoom one. Everyone say hello to Lack. Hello. And finally, uh, because uh, the three of us are kind of a little on the, the slightly younger side and uh, therefore not as seasoned in our anime watching experience, we needed an expert when it comes to older stuff around. Somebody who has been keeping the Black Lodge in, or, sorry, the Black Lodge video rental store in service and who actually remembers when you could buy anime on VHS tapes. Everyone, please welcome Spaceman Hardy! <laughs> There's actually, some wrestling in this too. For the record, I actually do prefer the animes Jinian dub for Akira, but that's just. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, yeah. I, I, I gotta be honest. I haven't watched the uh, the streamlined version of Akira, so I, I don't know how it actually holds up to the Bang Zoom one. I have nothing against the people in that dub. I just actually do prefer the 2001 dub. But... Okay, fair enough. I, I'm sorry. I'm, I think I uh, misremembered uh, our Q and A we did a while ago. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> you you uh, do remember that you remember like um was it um the uh, the old um 
JoJo's Bizarre Adventure dub, if I remember. Yeah, which also I don't like. That being said, there's a lot of streamlined dubs I genuinely love. I have a big soft spot for streamlined, but Akira is not one of them. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Maybe we'll get to those in a later episode. Yeah. But anyways... So yeah, we've decided to kick things off with what is arguably the very first anime dub ever produced. The, the very first English dub of a Japanese animated production. This is Haku Jaden, or as it was, uh, which Haku Jaden translates to uh, Tale of the White Serpent, which is a, a very famous Chinese folktale. So you would think that uh, the English speaking audience would uh, recognize it by that name. Uh, no. <laughs> when this movie came out in uh, the uh, early 60s, uh, American distributors decided, yeah, White Snake. That, yeah, that's uh, nobody's gonna remember that. Let's change the name. Let's instead call it Panda and the Magic Serpent. Brilliant marketing decision, right there. <laughs> they, 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 they like the snake part, but they wanted a cute, marketable animal to put on the poster. And since presumably no one in America who wasn't already from somewhere in East Asia knew what a red panda was, they went with the other panda. <laughs> I mean, they could have saved themselves the problem by just calling it pandas and the white serpent, I guess. But, you know. but that, that's not a panda. That's clearly a, a, a cat, as you can tell. I mean, look at the ears. Right. I realize now that I neglected to actually give a plot synopsis of this movie when we started this. So I, I will go ahead and do that right now. So in case you want to know what this movie's about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, like we said, Panda and the Magic Serpent is uh, based on the Chinese folktale of the White Serpent, which is essentially about a uh, mythical white snake who uh, transforms into a woman and falls in love with a scholar named uh, Xu Zhang, and their uh, interactions are considered kind of taboo, and so they are uh, foisted in their romantic relationships by a monk named Fa He, who uh, has superpowers of his own, essentially, and tries to keep them apart, uh, doing that by sending the guy to prison, essentially, or to a, a endeavored work camp, from the looks of it, because he does get money for it. Um, and he's only helped in his uh, uh, escape from this lifestyle by his sidekicks, Panda and Mimi. Uh, Panda, of course, being a panda bear, and Mimi being credited as a cat in the American dub, even though anyone who's been alive in the last 20 years could probably look at it and say, hey, that's a red panda, and you are correct. That is indeed a red panda. So there, and uh, in the end, uh, true love conquers all. But yeah, th so um, yeah, we're going to talk about this, and um, we're going to change up our format for doing this a little bit because not only did I make these three gentlemen suffer through the film, and we'll talk about why it's suffering in a little bit. Uh, it wasn't that bad, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> not not how you choose to usually spend a Friday night, right? Yeah, yeah. What are you talking about? This is my life. <laughs> So uh, what we're going to do is, um, uh, you, those of you out there uh, probably have heard of this movie if you're uh, much of a connoisseur of like the classics of Toei animation, because this was actually the very first Toei full-color animated feature film. Uh, they were basically founded in 1956, started doing some television work, and then they decided we want to get want to foray into the theatrical animated film market, and so this is the film that they made. So not only is this a, a first in terms of anime dubs, it's also a first in terms of Japanese animation, and we're kind of fortunate that it was also uh, very quickly ported over to America with a uh, questionable dub results, but we'll, we'll talk about that and debate it back and forth a little bit. I so. mean, I was going to say, this probably didn't do very well, right? Because it's not like it's considered a classic of American cinema or anything. It certainly, it certainly doesn't have the, the prestige that a Miyazaki film does. Un no, uh, it doesn't. Un unclear? Not, um, um, a lot of people point to, um, to Astro Boy as the, like, the very first uh, anime thing that was in America. That came a couple years after this. Uh, that was like 1964, I believe, on NBC. So, you know, not only uh, did it get a lot more exposure, but, you know, a lot more people remember it still even today. So, yeah, you're right. By comparison, uh, Panda and the Magic Serpent didn't quite get the, uh, the long-term recognition. It's certainly not a household name in uh, Western otaku spheres. Yeah, and M Mighty Adam Astro Boy lent itself to American audiences way better than this did. Mm. So, yeah, Which is, uh, it's just odd because it's, it's such a poor animated production. What, Astro Boy? Oh, God, yes. Well, yeah. You're, you're, I, mean... I, I, re I remember seeing an episode of that very late on laying on Adult Swim, and one of the fight <laughs> scenes is just a bunch of still images. This is getting a little off topic, but have you guys watched any of Gigantor? It's on Amazon Prime. Oh, a little bit. 
It's so funny, because, like, there's literally a character named Dick Strong in it. It's great. <laughs> um, but to talking about how well this movie was received, I actually tried to look up and see if there was any, like, a box office or reviews for this. Um, and this is kind of limited by what I could find online. I, it, any letterbox reviews? <laughs> no, I wanted stuff from, like, when it came out, basically. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing, I could find, there were two other anime movies that came out this same summer in 61, and I could find stuff for them pretty consistently. This was impossible, probably because this was put out by, like, a no-name rinky-dink company that only ever put this out before unceremoniously collapsing, I guess. Yeah, um, this was, yeah, distributed by a company uh, called Glow Pictures, who, according to their IMDb page, produced a total of seven films in their entire history, oh, this that, being one of them. The, most of those are not the same globe. Oh, you know, oh, they're different ones. No, as far as far as I can tell, this particular company, this was the only thing they actually got finished and released. Ah, curse you, IMDb. Uh, no, I, IMDb does that a lot. You'll find, especially for like smaller things, sometimes they'll just kind of get globbed together because no one really knows what the difference is. Um, That's fair. Uh, so I, I don't. I wasn't able to find reviews of this. So I was able to find reviews of the other two movies, and they were reviewed surprisingly well. Like, a bunch of them were like, eh, this is a fun movie. Your kids will like it. What were the yeah, other ones? Are, the other uh, ones are Magic Boy and uh, Alakazam the Great. Yeah, those two actually, I think, did a little, were a little more iconic. Yeah, At I, least Alakazam the Great, I thought. I was going to so. say, I think they both benefited that, like, uh, Magic Boy was put out by MGM, who were, like, one of the big five still. And uh, Alakazam was put out by American International Pictures, Pictures I, uh, the company that put out all of Roger Corman's stuff, who were an indie, but they're a big indie at least. Yeah, and uh, I, if I remember correctly, that that dub, which you know we may cover on uh, future episodes, but that one at least had the um, the notoriety of people like um, uh, who was it, um, Sterling Holloway in the dub too. Frankie Avalon. See, I, I <laughs> only I know who Frankie like, Avalon. Is. <laughs> hmm. There's a <laughs> like a teen idol kind of thing. I'm assuming. Y yes, yes, he's a teen idol. Okay. See, I, see, this is why I pulled these guys together, people. Like, I, I love studying old animation stuff, but I, I've got blind spots, and these guys are way more knowledgeable at some of those than I am. He wasn't that guy with the weird hair in the MST3K episode, was he? Frankie Avalon, the the guy in, like, Caveman or something like that? That doesn't narrow it down. I, oh, yeah. Wait, wait, no, hold on. I have a tangent, so... That's Arch Hall Jr.? <laughs> That's it. Yeah, that's so. That here, is. So okay. here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Globe only ever put this out, but apparently, prior to getting released, they were attached to a low-budget crime drama called The Choppers. You want to know who stars in The Choppers? Arnold Schwarzenegger? No, Archal Jr. Uh... Oh. It's all connected, it all guys. It all comes full circle. You're right. Anyways, but anyways, um, wait, let's talk. Tangent, let's talk but... about the actual movie more. So, yeah, um, thank you, um, Amon, for covering a lot of the background information. So, like we said, um, small group, uh, small company put the dub for this together. Um, and this was, uh, it's not like they went out of their way to try to find it. Uh, Japan was really trying to make uh, movies that could compete with Disney specifically in the animated global box office sphere. So that's not only why this movie was able to find an American distributor, but they were also, their style was very Disney-like. And, and anyone who's seen any parts of this movie will know that this looks like a Disney feature. It's animated on the ones, it's fully color, the cartoon animals get way more screen time than the humans do, and so because of that, uh, it's really interesting to talk about the people who put this together. So, rather than doing segments like we normally do on this podcast, I'm just going to rattle off all of the ADR staff and the main actors of it, and from there we will go ahead and talk about it a little bit. So, and uh, you guys, of course, feel free to jump in on anything that you've got to add. I know, Amon, you've got uh, lots of points on some of the different actors here. And if anyone out there listening has like a, oh, I know that name, when a name has popped up, then you are a very seasoned weeb and um, you, are, you are one of us. You belong in our group. <laughs> so, um, ADR director. Okay. Uh, the, the actual directing for this was done by a gentleman named Robert Tafer. Now, uh, he is probably best known uh, for doing bit parts in productions like Gunsmoke and Man From U.N.C.L.E. And get used to those two titles for TV shows, because we're going to be talking about actors who are in a lot of 60s TV shows from that time period, and Robert happened to be one of them. 
Aman, I believe you had something else about uh, what he's actually done aside from acting, if I remember. Uh, yes. Uh, some, uh, when I was doing research for this, I reached out to uh, Mike Toole, the uh, the uh, you know writer and po- uh, commentator, uh, who very graciously assured me what information he's been able to scrape together about this movie over the years. Oh, that's cool. Um, and uh, and uh, let's see. I have my notes here. Uh, so Robert was uh, like he was partially a bit actor, and he, I think Mike Mike suspects a lot of the actors who are in this movie were probably people he knew from working on TV, which is part of the reason he was able to get them in. But also something he did is he would uh, dub foreign language f- films in the 60s. Uh, I wasn't able to find a lot of credits for them. I suspect because once you're talking about movies that old, you're very much at the mercy of, like, what survived, what's been written up on the internet, and so on, and so on. Poorly documented, yeah. Yeah, or, or like, if it is documented, it's all in, like, old encyclopedias that, like, you know, if your if your local library has it, you can go read it, but if you don't have physical access to it, like, sorry. Mm. Um, although I was able to find a movie that's uh, actually a streaming online called Meta Brazil, which he apparently did, directed the uh, English dub for, so, like, they are, they are out there if you at least know where to look for them. Okay. So, so yeah, that's the guy who did the ADR direction. And uh, talking about people who uh, he was also in connection with, um, he did have a couple of people do the script writing for this. Uh, those gentlemen were named Alvin Schoenseit and Ben Hazar, um, both of which uh, I actually could not find very much information for. Uh, again, I'm going to pass this over to Aman because he had some interesting information about how the two knew each other. Yeah, uh, so... Uh, of the two of them, Piv- Pivar is probably the more notable one. He had previously been a producer for Universal doing, like, the 30s and 40s. Uh, if you look at a lot of their, like, B-movie and horror stuff, his name pops up a lot as, like, scriptwriter or producer and stuff like that. Um, now, when you say, like, 30s and 40s must movie, are we talking about, like, um, uh, Abbott and Costello meet the mummy kind of era? Around, around them, but not those movies. More, more like the... Str- like you know, not non non intentionally comedic horror movies that uh, Universal were still making around that time. Okay, you know, like the the Leech Woman, like st- stuff that you only ever see because like Shout Factory or Scream or Scream Factory more accurately does like you know a box set of like old Universal movies or something like that. Gotcha. Um, um, and this this was something he made towards like the end of his life. I think this is actually like the last completed movie that he has a credit on uh, prior to him yeah, passing yeah. away. Yeah, the dub for this came out in uh, summer of 1961, and according to his credits, uh, he actually passed away in 1963, mm-hmm. so that's probably true. Uh, but he got in, but from what I can tell, Sean Sight was the real mover and shaker behind this. He has a fun story. Um, he, know, he knew Pivar because he was a distant relative of Pivar's wife, uh, and he was doing this because uh, earlier in his career, he had worked for a... I think it was like a minerals company that installed like flooring or something, but he would been involved in a little bit of... Um, company fraud and went to jail as you do and and him him going into the entertainment industry was his attempt after jail to kind of go into something more legitimate uh i will i will note one of his projects that never got off the ground was supposed to be a biopic of the noted gangster of the period um is it mickey cohen i think like an actual legit gangster who was like temporarily out of jail he would go back to jail for tax fraud like a year after they tried to do this um so you know (laughs) Relative definitions of straight and narrow. Uh, I mean, what, what better way to get straight and narrow than try to w- move into children's cartoons, right? I guess, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm but sure this, was... yeah, but this, this was, this was, you know, Globe Releasing was their company, and it, this was supposed to be like, you know, the start of a, you know, a, a long-running institution or what have you. And then, as far as I can tell, this is the only thing they made that actually like got released. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so. So, so let that be a fa- uh, knowledge to you people. You, you want to, uh, you know, start up your own fly-by-night company? Uh, don't let anyone tell you that you can't. <laughs> You'll never fail until you try. But we can't have that story unless we actually have our male, our, we have our human characters. So our lead male, Shu Sane, is voiced by one George Matsui. Um, and to give points to Lack here, uh, this is indeed one of the actors who... Uh, was born in 1943, and to my knowledge, is still alive today. So, According yeah, some of the actors so. <laughs> are still going. I'm sorry, what's that? According to Wikipedia, so, you know. That, which, of course, is a very reliable source. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why they wouldn't tell the truth on that, but um, anyways. So, uh, yeah, so that's uh, George Matsui, and uh, where have you heard of him before? Um, well, we talked about how we, uh, a lot of the actors here did bit parts in uh, television from the time period. So if you've seen stuff like The Time Tunnel the FBI, or I Spy, you may have seen George in those things. 
and those things. Again, you're probably a bit nerdier than the rest of us are. Um, his biggest uh, actual credit, though, was uh, directing a movie called Fanny Hill meets uh, Lady Chutley from uh, 1967. Oh, dear Lord. Are you serious? Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Have you heard that before? Oh, uh, Those are poor novels from the 1800s. Ah, gotcha. Well. What, Lady <laughs> Chatterley? Yeah, How and uh, what was yeah, Fanny, yeah. Fanny Hill? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Fanny Hill, too, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You gotta oh dear. Somewhere. Okay, uh, let, let's move on to someone who's a little more respectable, I guess. Um, our uh, white serpent, who is named uh, Ban Nang, is uh, voiced by Lisa Liu, who is also uh, still alive. She was born in 1927, so she's coming up on her 100th birthday. And I know a lot of you have Congrats. definitely seen her before. Because um, the, the thing that you've probably seen her in is a most recent thing, which is the movie Crazy Rich Asians, where she plays the character of Shang Su Yi. Um, I know a no lot. kidding, yeah, really? I know. That's yeah, she, awesome. I know, yeah. she's still going strong. And she had a, if, if she had a, I'm sorry, she had a very long career in uh, not just uh, acting, but in also uh, Chinese opera. Um, let's see, uh, uh, probably the other thing that you may have heard, seen her in is, um, aside from bit parts and things like Have Gun, Will Travel, and Bonanza, uh, she was also in the Academy Award-winning movie The Last Emperor as uh, Empress Dowager. So, yes, yeah, she, she's been around for quite a bit. Huh. If you if you've seen Crazy Rich Asians are trying to place her, she is the uh, a grandmother of the male lead. Right. And um, I think uh, she, she's also um, what, what did you say, Aman? She had uh, she has um, recognition for both the Film Actors Academy oh. and uh, no, it's a, it's that she is the she's the only, apparently she's the only person who is a member of both the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, which is the group that runs the Golden Globes, mm -hmm. and the Academy Academy of Motion Pictures Arts and Sciences, which is the company that runs the Oscars. I did not know that you. That it was hard to be part of both of those. I think part of it's that the Hollywood Foreign Press Association is kind of a scam. Ah. <laughs> so not something. I, you're... I I I come from the part of film Twitter that has opinions about the Golden Globes, none of which are very nice. Let's say. I mean, why would you I have mean, opinions about the Golden Globes? <laughs> oh, I mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. aren't the Golden Globes and Oscars basically just one big scam, anyways? I, I think it's that the Oscars try the Oscars try to be an actual legitimate awards association, and the Golden Globes is a way for the members of the Hollywood Foreign Press Association to drink with celebrities. Yeah, yeah, and I, get paid money. I, I don't blame them for that. I, if I was in that position, I'd want to do the same thing. That's yeah, true. <laughs> so okay, so I, I mean, I'm not going to hold that against Lucy Liu. Uh, no, she's no, actually no. she's done quite a bit Lucy more than Lou. Lou as well, Lucy Liu. Lucy Liu, Lisa Liu, not. <laughs> I haven't wow, even Lucy Liu's... She looks Lucy great Lou's for me! Holy shit! <laughs> Her makeup artist is amazing! God damn you guys. God damn it. But, but you know what? I'm going to have a lot less to say about uh, the next two characters to talk about because uh, the, uh, as opposed to uh, George and Lisa, not as much in the credits for these two. So uh, for voicing the panda and Mimi the red panda, we have uh, two actors by the name of Fernando Tejada and Virginia Blackman. I could not find anything else that either of these two have done. This is, to my knowledge, uh, the only screen credits that either of them have. And if you've seen the movie, uh, which we will talk about in a bit, that's probably a reason why they only have these two credits to their name. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to be very nice, but it's not going to be easy. So, um, the, uh, the other... Now, we have an antagonist, of course. We have the monk, Fa He, who is voiced by a name that you may actually know. Uh, Mel Wells, and I, if I say uh, you may know him, you may only know him for uh, playing the original florist owner, Gravis Mushnick, in The Little Shop of Horrors. Not the musical version with M Rick Moranis, but the original 1960 film that actually inspired the musical. Uh, he plays the, again, he plays the shop owner for that. Um, or, if you're on the weebier side of things, and you remember a little show called Spectre Man, uh, everyone, raise your hand if you've heard of Spectre Man. I feel like I have. Uh, you can't see it, but I am raising my hand. Okay, well, so, it, yeah, it's kind of a, like, a, it was a uh, live-action Japanese series that got imported over into America. Um, and it, despite the fact that it was only from the 60s, unlike Power Rangers, uh, it was actually broadcast on American television not long after its Japanese run. In the 70s, it was kind of a big thing on American television. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because Mel Wells was actually a writer and actor in that dub. So he's actually had experience with 
uh, adapting Japanese media into American media since this movie came out. Now, um, our uh, titular White Serpent also has a uh, lady in waiting. Uh, she has a little girl who's uh, turns. She used to be a fish. I was trying to think of a nice way to say this, but she used to be a fish. Now she's a little girl because this is a movie where all of the animals turn into humans, apparently. Um, now, Jai Quinn is actually voiced by Miko Taka. And that's, uh, again, we've also had two other uh, Asian Americans in this dub already. And uh, Mika is a third. And kind of a prominent one, too, because um, before this movie came out, she was prominently featured as Hana Oji in the Marlon Brando movie Sayonara. She was also... Yeah, I yeah, saw that. Yeah, yeah, that was... A, and, again, that's a, kind of a high bar to start your acting out on. Um, you may have also seen her... If you're a big Bob Hope fan, and I assume all of you are... She played the character of Fumiko in the Bob Hope film, A Global Affair. And she, uh, let's see here, uh, her final role was in 1982 uh, in The Challenge as Yoshida's wife. But uh, despite the fact that that was many years ago, she is still alive. So she just retired. B basically, at least from uh, acting, which is, uh, it's interesting. It's kind of a wonder why some people don't continue to do acting, but uh, some people are just more comfortable doing that. Well, I mean, they make as much money as they can and just don't want to do it anymore. It's true. Mm -hmm. Or something like that, yeah. I mean, look at Rick Moranis as an example. Like, you know, he was done with it, and he didn't feel the need to go back to it. Right. Sean Connery as well. He's like, I've made so much money in my life, I really don't even need to do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think every actor is making Sean Connery money, but uh, <laughs> maybe a similar mentality. Right, right. <laughs> right. I mean, Tom Cruise hasn't retired, so... Well... When you you know you got that, should, should I make a Scientology joke here? I feel like no. I should. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say it's not that. It's that uh, Tom Cruise is like Tom Cruise's life goal is clearly to do a stunt so dangerous it finally does kill him, and so he can't stop until that happens. I was gonna say something about like Tom Hanks is like this guy doesn't have to be acting anymore, but he does it for the love of it. Hmm. Right. And so, to round out the cast here, um, so we've gone through everyone who's a character in this, but, I mean, come on, this is a 1960s dub of a foreign thing. You gotta have a narrator. I'm so, you just can't put the movie out there without someone narrating over the whole thing. Luckily, we got one of the best that we could get in 1961. Ladies and gentlemen, please say hello to Marvin Miller, who is our narrator for this. And honestly, I think that is the most prominent name in this entire cast because he has been in a lot of stuff, both uh, screen and behind the voice, especially behind the voice. Um, if you watch the original Filmation version of the Superman cartoon, he played Aquaman in that. Uh, if oh, you, nice. Yes. Um, if you uh, are a big fan of UPA animation and you remember their short Gerald McBoing Boing, he played the narrator in that, which essentially meant he played all the characters because that was a cartoon <laughs> right. where one guy voices everything. Yeah, the whole, the whole point was is there was no voice acting in it. Yes, that's correct. Um, UPA is very respectable. Y'all people need to watch more UPA animation. As well as, <laughs> you need to watch the, the 1956 movie Forbidden Planet, which is a very right. well-renowned science fiction movie. The reason I bring that up is because Marvin also plays Robbie the Robot in that movie. Woo! Nice. Robbie! <laughs> And it was, of course, Leslie Nielsen before he did, started doing comedies. So, I remember very little of that film. All I remember was I got buy one, get one free boneless wings from Thursday at, uh, at uh, Buffalo Wild Wings while I was watching it. I think that says a lot more about you than it does the movie, Hardy. I just want to say. I'm surprised, Hardy, you, do, you don't remember them uh, making like, a, you don't remember them making a million pounds of bourbon in that movie? I've watched it in French, honestly. I I didn't even realize there was a dub until I checked the the, the wait, special wait, features. Wait, wait, wait. Are you are you wait? Are you are what? you thinking of what? the French animated movie from the seventies? Forbidden Planet. No, no this no, is a this no, is a no, science no. fiction movie from the fifties with no, Leslie yeah, Nielsen oh, in it. Not yeah, the French. Oh, not the French. No, you're thinking of Fantastic Planet. Oh, that's planet, right. That's, that's right. Yeah. Oh my yeah. god. No, for, for in, Forbidden oh, Planet's a different movie. Now I wish Leslie Nielsen had been in Fantastic Planet. That would be so surreal. I think we did have just found out the next movie we need to do on Dub Talk Retro. I am down for Fantastic Planet. I didn't even know that had an English dub, actually. Uh, it, so. Yeah, it's, it's very stiff. It is. It's very <laughs> stiff. 
That's a l- l- Roy Lelou is a very interesting director. Man, I could spend a whole hour talking about that guy. Thank you, Hardy, for the biggest laugh I'm going to get this whole episode. You mix up Fantastic Planet with Forbidden Planet. Wonderful. Yeah. And boneless right. wings. <laughs> Everyone needs boneless. So like I was saying with uh, this uh, episode here, we're just going to kind of go off the cuff here and talk about the overall dub. Because let's just go ahead and be honest straight up here. This is not a very good dub. A- am I being controversial? It sucks. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't suck. It's just, it's uneven. It's, it, okay, and also, to, this is a movie that the version that we watched is the same version that you're probably going to be able to find, which is a public domain version of the 60s original theatrical cut that has been reprinted on low quality film several times, so it does not look nearly as good as the animation should have. And that goes for the audio, too. Like, the audio is not that great either. It sounds like it was recorded with Gumby audio, and the voice acting goes with it. But, Hardy, what do you... Was there anything you liked about this dub? I liked the narrator. I think he was good. Um, And you can tell by Marvin Miller's performance that he's been doing this for a long time. Um, I guess one of my main issues also was that the narrator spoke a bit too much. Mm -hmm. It had a a, a little bit more... uh, uh, telling than showing uh, but that also is kind of the movie's fault because there was a lot of in my opinion unnecessary scenes that really didn't belong in it this movie is only 71 minutes long and I easily feel like even then it could have been 20 minutes shorter easily you want to know the sad um, part what is it the version we saw isn't even the full film they cut like 7 minutes out of the original Japanese film oh vey <laughs> I know right wow it, it, it does not help that the picture quality is so bad that the thing that would probably benefit those scenes the most, the really nice animation, because you, know, you can you can kind of see through the grime like it is nicely animated, um, but it's like, like, how much can you appreciate it when like the colors have been blasted out to almost like monochrome? Right. Uh, That's what you, you, know, you know why the narrator kind of works? Um, <laughs> it's because this is a pure, unadulterated fairy tale. This is pure fairy tale, and it's like... It, it's, it's like you're the, being told a story. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly, and that's why a narrator actually kind of works in this sense, and because yeah. there's actually very little dialogue for the actual characters that's in the true. story. Mm-hmm. So, and not only, but, and, uh, and he also helps with um, uh, one of the parts where um, I didn't think I'd like this, but I didn't really mind it. Was um, all of the songs, all the original Japanese songs, are kept intact with Japanese lyrics. Oh, and there's one in particular uh, where the, the little girl, Zhao Jing, is singing, where the narrator is actually talking over it, but he's not, like, interrupting it. It's like he's interpreting the lyrics for the listener because they weren't going to go back and redub the song with the, an English speaker. Well, are you sure the song was, all the songs were actually in Japanese? Because some of that sounded like Chinese. Like no, Antony. yeah, I think so. There was some dialogue in Chinese, at least. Uh, there was. I, I, well, I, I know that the one where the panda is bouncing on the drums, that sounds very Cantonese to me. I'm, I'm not a language expert, right. but it, it sounded more Chinese than Japanese, but that's just that's me. That's true. So. I do. No, I think well, you may I was, be right. Well, I, do, I think that was correct. Well, it, it's correct in that they clearly left in the original songs. And something I I realized while watching this, and I was I was able to dig up a, uh, a copy of the Japanese version to compare... There's chunks of the Japanese audio track just left in here unchanged. There are. I oh noticed that too. Like this, <laughs> the, the other, sword dancer. Yeah, exactly. The well, there's sword. one part I was listening here, and I'm like, did, did they just hire a bunch of white people to yell like East Asian-y sounding nonsense over this? And I looked it up, and it's like, no, this is the nope. same sound. They just left. Which, again, given that this was done by like a fly by night company on the cheap, like that absolutely makes sense. Why? Why dub any? Why dub anything you don't have to? Yeah, there's like another. Not to a, mention the fact that remember, this is the first time anybody was doing something like this. Well, it's yeah. not so the one, nobody. Well, I'm sorry. It's not the first. It's the first time they did it for Japanese stuff, but it's not the first time they did it for foreign anything at all. Um, another country that had a lot of animated output that was getting imported around this time was surprisingly enough Russia. Uh, the Soviet Union had a lot of animation being put out by their uh, their government sponsored studio at the time, and you can find a lot of Russian animation that has pretty similar dubs to this that was released on like um, low res television broadcasts around this time. Well, one thing that I noticed personally just by reading over the Wikipedia article that differentiates the English dub from the Japanese is in Japanese, this <laughs> whole entire dub only has two actors. It has one male actor and one female actor, and they cover all the roles in the entire film. That's so. surprising that the English dub didn't do that then. 
Yeah. I mean, the, the idea it's, was... It's actually... Yeah. Yeah, it's it's strange. I mean, they, they clearly felt they felt that uh, any sequences of no dialogue would, like, bore the children. So they're like, mm -hmm. well, we got to pad this out with something being spoken on screen. Um, I, I think the, the worst scene with the narrator is actually... Um, there, there's a bit where... Uh, what's going on? It's like... Um, Okay, there's a dream sequence where um, the male lead is kind of dreaming about his, you know, is dreaming about his girlfriend, and the narrator is just like explaining what's going on in his dreams. Like he dreamed of her, like, she shows up. He dreamed of butterflies, and then shows butterflies, and then suddenly the screen was covered in butterflies, and the screen is covered in butterflies. It's like we don't need that narrated, man. Again, it's a fairy tale, so you can kind of forgive that they're doing this. So, I mean, it, maybe for it, the it, most it, part. It is a little distracting just because I, th I think Noah is right. It does it does very much feel like you know, the kids are going to be bored if we're going to have someone talking. Can we? It's yeah. it's it, you know it's it's like it's that complaint I heard. I I feel like I've heard this complaint about like other even like more like not not still older but like more recent to this anime where they will kind of like I I, I want to say the original version of the English dub for Kiki's Delivery Service had this where they would occasionally just have Phil Hartman like improvise <laughs> stuff just to just to not have oh, nothing yeah. on the soundtrack. That's true. I remember. Well, that. Just to, to be like, fair, to be which, fa and in fairness, to be fair, Amon. <laughs> go on. To be fair, Amon. If you're gonna get Phil Hartman, you want him to improvise. I mean, look. I, I gotta be honest. If it's if someone's gonna be, you know, filling up space, I'd rather be Phil Hartman, who I love and adore. <laughs> uh, but it, it does feel like it's that same attitude of like, oh, if there's not enough, if there's not enough stimulating things happening in a given moment, the children are just gonna lose interest immediately. Right. Also, I'm a JoJo fan, so I'm just used to needless narration at this point. <laughs> so, and I assume every kid who saw this in the '60s was also a big JoJo's fan. <laughs> right. Exactly. For yeah. among even that Speedwagon was afraid. So, so they didn't exist for 20 years. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> They're all type travelers. <laughs> but okay, so yeah, I think we're in agreement that uh, like no one really had a problem with Marvin Miller's actual narration. Like he's his voice is very nice for this. Like when it comes to like mm -hmm. good full radio sounding narrators like you couldn't do much better at that time period C can i mention something else i liked in the dub sure, sure. uh i really like that demon thing that the princess talks to oh the, you guys know what i'm talking about the fish demon near the end yeah the the, mm. the, the devil fish or whatever his name was well there's two devil there's the dragon king and then there's the catfish king mm -hmm. so i think I, I think i'm talking about the catfish king. I mean, he yeah. like had the, 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 the warble effect on his voice yeah, the one at the yeah. very no 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 sorry sorry I'm getting confused. No, I'm the 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 um statue that she talks the Dragon to. Dragon King. Right. Dragon okay. King. Yeah, that's it. The, yeah, in outer space. Yeah, that thing. Okay, yeah, that. I, uh, I actually really liked the voice they gave him. Honestly, I think that was Marvin Miller as well. If I read the credits correctly. Oh, cool. Mm. So they kind of did no, this. No, no, no. It was different. It was. In fact, you wrote it down. Let me pull it up. No, oh. no. It the, was uh, Bob the, Neumann. I th no, I thought he was the Catfish King. Like, I went back and looked at the opening credits uh, after I wrote I'm, that down. I'm literally looking at what you wrote down, Noah. <laughs> I, d I know, and I am literally looking at the, uh, you know, the video version with the credits in front of it. But but the point is that, yeah, that, that big booming voice of the, uh, the dragon god character, whoever is voicing him, it's kind of like Monty Python's god, isn't it? Uh, I guess. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't have thought of that, but okay. Actually, what did I write down? No, no, I wrote down. Um, I, I think they were trying to emulate the Wizard of Oz, actually. The, the uh, you know, the big head floating in the fire, uh, for that. Sure. Scene. And that's that's not a bad reference to use for for that kind of character. Right. Honestly. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So I. I, I don't know. I, I just remember seeing that scene and I was like, oh, this guy's actually pretty good <laughs> in this this part of the dub. And cl so. And clearly he'll be around for the rest of the movie. And then. Right. Nope. No. So, okay, so that's something you liked. Amon, what's something that you liked about this dub? 20 minutes later. <laughs> I, 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 think, I, think it, I think it is interesting. Like, one, the thing, one of the things it reminds me of is when I, when, I, when I first saw the streamlined dub for Akira, um, it stuck, and part of this is because of who's worked on it, it struck out to me, it's like, oh, this sounds so much like a, uh, specifically like a TV cartoon you know, dub slash voice acting from the era, mm -hmm. and how how very how very much of its time it was. And that's the kind of thing that sticks out here as well. Is like this really sounds like, and not not quite because most most of the movies, anime movies from this period, I'm familiar with are like kind of Disney stuff, which are you know a little more high budget. There's a, probably a little more professionalism going into them. 
Um, but this is this, 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 this is kind of what that it reminds me of. It's like, oh, this this is. I find it interesting in just how like of its time it is. Mm -hmm. um, just cause, you know, especially because like you know, dubs this old are not generally that easy to get. Like once you start getting like you know. The amount of anime, you know, that got brought over for the rest of the 60s and the 70s and part of the 80s wasn't a lot, but there was stuff getting brought over, uh, right, and like, it didn't necessarily keep sounding like this, and I find that interesting. Like, what was the um, the redub of uh, Gatchaman called? It was, like, Battle of the Planets or something like that? Yeah, Battle... There were, yeah. like, three of those. Yeah, which, which you know, from, from the little I've heard, like, sounds very much like, you know, a 70s cartoon. Right. Uh, so, you like, you... So, I, I find this interesting just because it sounds like... Yeah, because like, it had like Casey Kasem in it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I, yeah, I do. I kind. Of, this is one of these. This is one of these things where, like, in this version at least, I find this very interesting as like a historical artifact. Is kind of like, uh, you know, this is you know, you know, the you know the the first animated you know well the first animated really get brought over here. Um, and I also find this interesting in contrast with like the bits I've seen with. Um, I haven't seen any Magic Boy, but I've seen a little bit of Alakazam the Great, and it's interesting kind of seeing like, here's an anime dubbed by a company with a lot of money. Here's an anime dubbed by a company with some money. Here's an anime dubbed by a company with no money. <laughs> None. Yeah, that was money. negative money. Shoestrings and lint. Pretty much. I, I, I found I found, I found, found a blog who like uh, had written up like every animation news item from Variety from the first half of 1961, and they mentioned that like Marvin Miller had been signed by this company to just do any general, any general narration they needed to have. Like trailers, oh. shows, whatever. Just like he had been hired to do that. Uh... So and not, like you can mm -hmm. speak it to a microphone. Yeah, basically. No, no. Especially, it's like, oh, you're 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 a voice actor of talent. Let's get as much out of you as we can. And get out of him, they did. That's probably why <laughs> they slathered his narration all over the movie. <laughs> we, we've I mean, only just, got the other just, actors I, for a couple minutes, but we got Marvin I, well, all week. I, I, don't, I mean, it's like there's not a lot of dialogue in this movie. It's not very talky. They're, no, you're they're not. You're right. There's not, which is probably a good. Uh, let, let's move over to actually talking about uh, the two leads at least. Let's talk about George and Lisa because I know that they're that the acting on them is not the best because they don't have a lot of dialogue to work with. But I do think that, um, like, I could see them being actors in like a Hanna Barbera cartoon from that same time period. Like, they, they could easily be bit parts on Rough and Ready or uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle. So. I give George and Lisa a little bit of credit on that, especially because uh, this was probably material that was completely foreign to them at the time. I, again, I, I know they were Asian Americans, but I don't know how steeped in knowledge of stuff like the White Serpent they would have had for the time period. Uh, I think Lisa might have had more, just because she also did Chinese opera. But um, yeah, I, I don't think it's that bad. There are worse actors in this dub than uh, George and Lisa. Yeah, mo most of the humans sound fine, at least. Um, they're not necessarily given a lot to work with, but I think, like, you know, George and Lisa and Miko, at least, I think, sound fine. Mm -hmm. Mel, well, it's not a it's not a very deep story. No. I mean, for one thing. What are you talking about? It, it's about a man falling in love with a snake. That That's super deep. That's very progressive. <laughs> for 1950s. emotional. Actually... On, on the subject of progression, I will say it is kind of interesting that they decided to get, like, Asian actors to be in this dub. Yeah, that's true. Like, yeah, um, that, was something that, that was something that stuck out to me, too, because, like, you know, this is, this is 1961. They're not going to usually spend a lot of time worrying about, like, you know, representation or something like that. But I, I guess in the, in the minds of the people dubbing this, they were just kind of like, well, they're Asian. Let's get Asians to play it. You know, I mean, this is like a couple. Uh, how, I don't know how many years later it was, but um, uh, not too long after this, Hanna Barbera would put out the show, uh, The Amazing Chan and the Chan Clan, which is uh, noted yeah. as I, I'm sure many of you saw Boomerang saw that show, um, but they didn't have any Asian Americans in the cast, to my knowledge. Well, to be fair, Charlie Chan was rarely ever played by an actual. Asian I know player. he wasn't. So, <laughs> couldn't even. But I guess. They probably would have called them Orientals at the time or something, but I don't know. Uh, uh, but yeah, no, I, I do think it's interesting. I do think it's really interesting, especially in the state of the way dubs are now, to see a dub like the one of the first, if the first Japanese dub, actually try to get like Japanese and Asian actors to be mm -hmm. in it. It's it's something you really wouldn't think that they would have bothered doing. Because they didn't do it for Astro Boy. 
No, and they didn't do it for um, Alakazam or Magic Boy, to my knowledge. Or Speed Racer, or anything like that. <laughs> or, no, they, no, because they, they were definitely trying to um, to scrub the uh, the Japanese influence off of those uh, TV shows. Yeah, and most dubbing companies wouldn't want to spend the money to try something that hard these days. So uh, you're right. Um, and it was also um, and now when I first saw this, because um, I saw this about a year ago. From Unless the first of course time, it's like Great Pretender. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that yet. I still gotta get around to that. Yeah. I was the only one here who was on the Great Pretender episode, right? Mm. I, I think, think so. so. Oh, okay. Yeah. I I'm way behind in my backlog. As you can tell by the fact that I'm watching movies from 1961. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Hardy, did you have any um, thoughts on uh, our human characters specifically? They sucked. Come on. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to mince words. I do not think this dub was very well done, but I mean, that, that it speaks largely to the fact that it is very much a product of its time, and I think that it can be it can be enjoyed and appreciated for being a product of its time, but I'm not going to mince words and say that it was very well acted or produced. Um, yeah. It was well animated. It is well animated if you can get a version that doesn't look like it's white the entire screen. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, I just I they did not stand out to me. Not at least the two the two leads. They I mean, you could say the same thing of Snow White, honestly. But the, you know, the, well, Snow the White, two as the, two the actress, leads, yeah. the two leads were probably the least worst of the cast, if I'm being perfectly honest. Because mm -hmm. once we get into um, once we get into the animal sidekicks, that's just that's a whole level of, of awful. <laughs> that. Well, let's just go ahead and do that then. So uh, I never yeah. would have guessed that Panda and the Magic Serpent would be our most heated discussion in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because we haven't gotten to the no. dub for Bible Black yet. Like, like won't let us uh, do that. I'm not doing that. Is oh well, step aside then. Yes. <laughs> Step aside, Sonny. Speaking of bad voice <laughs> acting, um, yeah, uh, Panda and Mimi are uh, probably the actors that are not going to be the most, uh, are not going to be anyone's favorite. Um, now, uh, like I was saying before, Fernando and Virginia had not done anything else since or before this, to my knowledge, and that may be because their acting is not really good in this. I'm sorry. It, it's really... Okay, Panda's got this, like, low, monotone, does-not-match-that-character-design voice. Uh, yeah, that was... I remember the first time I heard Panda's voice, and I was just like, that's the voice they're going for. Okay. And then you He basically just mumbles his entire dialogue. He's, like, He's Brian okay, Griffin, let's... basically. Okay, let's go. It doesn't match... Yeah, it doesn't match at all. It, it, this is, like, really stilted acting. And hey, Peter, we gotta go save the princess. <laughs> I, I love the, I do love one part that's, like, unintentionally funny. He's like, we'll never find him. And then five seconds later, look, there he is. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think I remember that, too. I remember laughing at that. So. So, so we got that, and then we contrast that with Virginia's Mimi, which is ear-splittingly chirpy, like the highest that a human could get to. It is the most Pokemon-ish voice of the entire movie. Yeah. She doesn't even really have a whole lot of actual spoken dialogue. Most of it's just high-pitched animal noises. It is, although she gets, again, all of her lines that is actual dialogue is kind of funny in an unintentional way. Like, there, there's a scene near the beginning where the two leads are, uh, like, going off to be with each other, as you do, and Mimi's just like, left behind after all we did. Well, again, I think they were trying to be Disney. Oh, oh! This is very much like, hey, what's the worst version of like Disney funny animal cartoons? <laughs> I, 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 you know, I mean, this... I would not be surprised to learn that these two people don't have any other acting credits because they were like non-actors who work for the company or something. Yeah, and they, they were, were just, yeah, they were just, and it was like, hey, Fernando can do a funny voice and Virginia can do a funny voice. Let's get them in here to like save on costs because we don't have to go find yeah. actual actors to do it. Yeah, I think it's kind of a shame, too, that Panda doesn't have a voice actor because he's kind of the most badass in, in the entire film. <laughs> Technically, he is. Right. I remember wa like, while I was watching the fight scene, I was like, this is kind of violent for a kid's movie. But I'm like, his so entire shtick is that he is invulnerable to pain, and he beats up the bad guys, like, by himself. Panda could beat Goku, no cap. <laughs> <laughs> we are not opening that Pandora's box again. 
<laughs> I'm glad Panda you... could take a punch from Saitama. Well, anyone can take a punch. They just can't stand afterwards. Yeah. I'm glad that you brought up the, uh, the violence portion of it, Lack, because... Um, I consulted a couple of books while researching this. Uh, one of them was Anime Classic Zetai, 100 Must See Anime by Brian Camp. And uh, he listed this movie as one of them. Uh, but uh, every one of his recommendations has like a, uh, a content filter for stuff that may be objectionable for younger viewers. And mm -hmm. the one thing they pointed to was this movie had some violence because a character beats up another character. Yeah, it's really, it's really like not like censored at all. Like... I guess it's, there's no blood or anything, but still. No, it, it kind of reminds me of a Popeye fight. It's, mm, yeah, it is. It's yeah. a Popeye versus Bluto interaction. So that, uh, that defines those characters. Um, again, I, I'm not entirely sure why they felt the need to... Well, I, I do know why they gave them those kind of voices. They, they wanted them to be cartoony sounding. And they just... Right. <laughs> it's like, let's just go to the extremes. One will be flat, low, monotone. The other will be high, chirpy Pokemon. And the, the best excuse you could give for a lot of the weird decisions in this dub is just that they didn't know how to do it yet. I, mean, I, th so. I, th I think part of it's also... Do you want to know the time frame of this movie? Of this movie getting dubbed and released? Was it like a month? According to, well, according to Variety, the, the company that like got the distribution rights from Toei then sold them to Globe, Data International, They give a, there's a listing of Variety of them offering this in March 14th, 1961. The movie premiered in June. That's insane. This is this is three months from in three months they sold the movie to this company and then dubbed and released it. In that three is months. like that is like Robin wow. Thicke's Paula turnaround speed. Yeah. So and unfortunately, I think you can kind of see that uh, they did they did not necessarily have the qualifications or money to have something with that quick a turnaround and also be like good. <laughs> It's probably it's surprising then that they got um, like for all the bad parts in here that Marvin Miller's turned out so well because he's just that good you know he could just knock out the lines one after another. He's the kind of guy who could probably read a phone book and, and make it sound. Oh, oh heck awesome. yeah! I, coming soon to uh, to ASMR. Marvin Miller reads the phone book. <laughs> <laughs> um, <sighs> so yeah, so uh, no no real positive thing to say about Panda and Mimi on their voice ends of it. Um, but again, we're just we're kind of chalking that up to it's not good, but it's kind of just a product of the time. If, if you've seen like old 60s animation for that time period, for television animation specifically, it's just kind of what you come to expect for background characters, essentially. Mm. Um, now, f we're kind of finishing this off here. Um, I do want to talk about uh, the other two. Well, one of them is the human character of Fei Ha, and the uh, the fish girl, uh, Zhao Jing. I, I'm sorry, I know I'm mispronouncing these. I don't speak Mandarin. Um, but the reason I wanted to bring this yeah, up... Yeah, I know that S, if, it start, if it starts with an X, it's pronounced Sha. Yeah, Sh she. Sha. Sha King, I believe. Right, I I'm got, not sure about that. I, I'm I not did, sure about the Qs. I believe it's Jing, like a J sound. But mm -hmm. I, I'm sure I will be corrected by our Chinese listeners in the comments section. Um, but um, uh, the thing I want to talk about is that uh, even though Mel Wells uh, is, uh, you know, he's best known for doing, like, B-movie kind of stuff here, he sounds like he's having the most fun playing the bad guy in this. Like, he's got... Maybe. Uh, he's got, <laughs> Maybe. Like... He, he, he is very stiff still, but, I mean, yeah. He, he, he's, I don't... I don't, I'll be honest, I spent a lot of it kind of wondering, it's like, is he just doing a voice or is he trying to do an accent? Hmm. Mm. See, and I, I couldn't, and the problem is I couldn't decide. I mean, the, the thing is that if you watch it, and um, this is easier to pick up because his character animation is the one that's not the least washed out, is that mm -hmm. he's actually trying to match the lip flaps. Because uh, he's a character that has, like, the, the most frames animated on the mouth movements. And so you see him trying mm -hmm. to actually match that with his acting. That makes sense. Um, and... Uh, I mean, it's it's not the best, but um, it, it's kind of it's the most like kung fu film dubbing ish of the entire uh, cast. I feel like, mm, yeah. but uh, Shashig, I must save you from your from your curse. Oh no, you killed him! You killed him yourself. <laughs> that's what it's like. That, that's exactly what it's like throughout the whole thing. But again, it's it's kind of fun to watch, and, and if you know what kind of movie you're getting into, like he's not. He's not a, a villainous character. He's not a Disney kind of villain. He thinks he's doing the right thing. 
He's just a selfish jerk, really. I'm not even sure if he's that. He's just, you know, he's... He's like a witch hunter, you know. He thinks he he sees right. spirits and he thinks it's bad. And in fact, the um, if you look at like the history of this story, like the original uh, Chinese folktale, um, apparently it was supposed to be a good versus evil story where the the monk was the good guy and the snake was a bad guy. But over time, it uh, people interpret it more as a no, uh, the guy and the snake are in love with each other, and the monks actually the misunderstood guy it's like i think like miko kind of falls into the same category as george and lisa i think they're she's doing like she's fine for what she has to work with uh and i think i think you're right i think mel is trying to match the lip flaps a lot more exactly and he's trying but <laughs> i think i think if i i think if i have heard his performance a little more than it helped and he's hammy at least yeah he does you can, he's enjoy, it, you, you can enjoy the which i'll always part. take hammy over yeah. bland yeah there's a lot of there's exactly. a lot of gusto in his performance there is, especially near that final he scene. Where... He at least, I don't know if he's giving it his all, but he at least seems like he is, he wants to be there. So. Well, well, for 1960s glow pictures, not very good money, I'm sure he's giving them as much as they're worth. Yeah, mm. exactly. Yeah. So, um, now, so in talking about that, I guess, um, let's wrap this up by, uh, do we, um, I suppose, uh, would we recommend this movie to other people? Only if you're really, really interested in this kind of thing. I, I, I'd, I'd recommend it if you're historically interested. My recommendation would go up a little bit if, like, if Discotech or somebody could put out a nice, you know... Because this thing got restored recently. There's a nice, pristine yep. version of the Japanese release. Yep. And if Discotech could, like, you know, get that and do their wizardry and include, you know, get the right, you know, the be the okay to include like a cut a, ver a new version of the english cut with that nice and restored footage on it i would recommend it more it's also short Definitely. so it's not like you're gonna have to invest a ton of time into it uh but like, like it's easier to watch this than it even is the disappearance of haruhi suzumiya so like <laughs> you know of all the examples you could have picked you picked that three hour movie that's a long that's a long friggin' movie man that's like two hours 40 minutes have you ever watched it yes you're right it was I have. It's, it's, and it's, it's a it, good movie, but it's like long. It. <laughs> it is long. You're right. Crispin Freeman even made a comment about that at one convention. He was like, um, when he got the script for it, he was like, oh my god, I never shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Which is true. That's because it was originally meant to be another season. Oh. That's what I've heard too, yeah. It honestly yeah, works it, better as a movie. I don't know about that, um, but if any of you want to know, um, uh, Red Bard, who's a YouTuber out there, did a whole video about how, yeah, this was supposed to, the disappearance was supposed to be its own season, and then for whatever reason it got rolled into a movie, but they still had to make a season, so that's kind of why the uh, the season two, which is, you know, the five episodes of the Psy of Haruhi Suzumiya and the Endless Eight arc is kind of structured the way that it is because they weren't planning on making it a full season to begin with. Ir regardless, my point was is that the the something to consider is the fact that Panda and the Magic Serpent is short, and it's not a long investment of a film. I, so. I, and I don't think speak you know yeah. speak to yourself. I was watching it and it was I it was seventy one minutes long and I still think it was twenty minutes too long. I mean, I still wouldn't really recommend it to any casual anime fan. I mean, I, let's be on. Let's be honest. If I was talking to like some like seventeen year old or something who was like, "Hey, wh what should I watch to really get into anime?" I'd be like, "Well, not fucking this." <laughs> yeah. No, I think I my thing is it is culturally significant, so it is a movie that you should watch once, just to say in case you are interested in the culture of the time. Just because it is culturally insignificant does not mean it is good. However, it does have some really good parts. I especially enjoyed the sorcery battle. Mm. That was my favorite part. Oh, yeah. And the, the flood at the end. Yeah. And those are my two favorite parts. And, of course, Panda's big brawl with, with the white pig gang. Um, my suggestion, save it for the edibles. Yeah, and I, and given the fact that the only way to really see this in America right now is to either hunt down the... Uh, uh, public domain DVD rips or to purchase it from Amazon right now for two bucks. I also can't really say I'd recommend it on those grounds. Wait for uh, that nice uh, updated version of it to be released because uh, the only way to see this right now legally in streaming version is to watch the public domain version that is uploaded to Amazon right now, which requires an additional two bucks to rent it. 
I can't recommend it on those grounds. Wait for it to get re-released uh, with a like higher resolution version of it because something that is this well animated, because again, it is very high quality animation, deserves to be seen in its proper resolution. So wait for that to be released in America is what I say. But um, hint, yeah, hint, Disco we are, Tech. I'm not going to be shy about this. When this episode goes up, I am going to tag Disco Tech and say, I don't care what it takes. Put out a... Uh, uh, Kickstarter to raise the funds for it, put out a donation box, whatever it takes there, we will chip in to get the, well, I will chip in to make this thing a reality, because it needs to be seen in its proper resolution. I want to see the colors! So that, but that, ladies and gentlemen, is our full discussion on Panda and the Magic Serpent. It was not the funnest thing ever, but it was interesting to break out of our normal form and watch stuff from before our parents were born. For some of us, maybe not all of us, but for some of us. Hmm. So uh, let's wrap this up here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, Lack. Uh, what are you doing these days, man? What am I doing these days? Uh, I'm making an ass of myself on TikTok. All mostly. right. That's what I'm doing these days. Uh, you can find me at like the Watcher on TikTok. I do a lot of weird JoJo stuff, and sometimes I branch out from that. Um, uh, mostly when I'm not doing that, I'm trying to write. Uh, I got my webcomic, uh, Sunscreen. Uh, it's about girls surfing. Uh, I'm really happy with the story. Uh, the second episode should be out sometime in the near future, hopefully. Uh, you can find it uh, on Webtoons. Just just type in, in the search engine uh, Sunscreen and it should pop up. Um, yeah, uh, that's pretty much it for me right now. Uh, I just got cast in a visual novel, which is kind of cool. Yeah, uh, my hmm. Meister High. Uh, if you Google that, you should be able to find it. So yeah, yeah, that should be uh, that should be it for me. And, and will will so. you be trying to uh, to emulate uh, Fernando's panda voice in that visual novel? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Can't wait to hear it. Aman, what are you up to these days? Uh, I'm mostly on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at uh, um, at AmonDuel US. Duel has two U's in it. Uh, I talk about movies and comic books and stuff, and I also talk about music. And I have a I have a song for oh, us. If thank you like oh, thank you. So I'd be so disappointed if you didn't have one for us. Well, I I, I was a little bit of a stump to what to do with this because it's 1961, which is not one of these years I know a lot of. It's that weird period where uh, 50s rock music was died out and like Motown's starting to get there but not really and the British Invasion's still a few yep. years off. So I decided, alright hey, what was a, what was at the top of the Billboard charts the, the month this movie came out? When this movie came tell. out. I uh, technically have two because because the actual answer is Travel a Man by Ricky Nelson. Which is like a pretty good song if a little bit dated. But the number one song the week before that was Running Scare by Roy Orbison, which is an extremely good song that you should go listen to immediately. Well, I mean, it's Roy Orbison. It's great. It's Roy Orbison. What is not I know, an extremely right? good song? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you like it when Roy Orbison belts out huge sweeping ballads about love and loss? Then do we have a song for you? And I know some of us were running scared of this dub, so that is also fitting. <laughs> Speaking of running scared of this dub, Hardy, what are you up to these days, man? Do you really want the true answer? Do I want the truth? Of course I do. Because if, if I don't like it, I can just cut it out of the final episode. Well, these days I sleep, usually sleep 18 hours a day. Um, but no, I'm, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Spaceman Hardy. I don't really have any sort of creative things like these other guys do. I mainly just retweet some uh, artwork and post goat pictures and say donkey pants. And, and that's just who I am. No, that's good. No, that, that, that is living, man. That is the American dream right there. Living the dream, man. Hey, large three-topping uh, pizza from Little Caesars, man. <laughs> Gotta use that stimulus. T <laughs> I, I am going to take the, your your uh, tweet from that, that post and put that right in the episode right here. Mm -hmm. All right, and um, my name is Noah Clue. You can follow me on Twitter at Noah Clue. Um, I also, like Hardy, am not really doing anything on the creative side these days, um, as well because I am working full-time and have three children to take care of, who I post pictures of on Twitter, and I also use Twitter to uh, have long discussions about the new things I'm learning about from really old animation, like the fact that a lot of 1920s animation was just really cheaply made cartoons based on comic strips that the cartoon studio happened to own at the time. So do your research, people. Like uh, in this episode, where I learned a lot of information from the Animated Movie Guide by Jerry Beck, and like I said, Anime Classics Zetai 100 
must-see anime by Brian Camp. So, like Amon was saying earlier, go to the library to do your research. You can learn a ton of stuff there. And we are the Dub Talk Podcast. You can follow us here on the Dub Talk Podcast on YouTube. As of this recording, we just passed 5,000 subscribers. Woohoo! Woohoo! Yay! Not Woo! sure what we're going to do. Well, I do know what we're going to Yay! do to celebrate that. But uh, I'd, I'm going to try to talk Lilac into doing something else to celebrate, too. But, yes, thank you all for helping us to get there. And, of course, a big, big part of that success comes directly from our patrons. We want to give a huge shout out to all the people who support us over on Patreon. We want to give a huge mm-hmm. shout out to our $5 patrons. That would be, of course, Megan's mom and dad. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Megan's mom. Thank you, Michelle Travis. Thank you, the Miraculous Core Zone. Thank you, Nico Robin, but with yaoi hands. <laughs> thank you, Sue Tweet. And thank you, Victor May Baroda. You guys are amazing. And also amazing big thanks to our ten dollar patrons on patreon these are the guys who put in a little extra money get the episodes early and help make all of this possible huge shout out to carly lestikow major thanks to crimson echidna thank you super to jacob wilson extra huge special thanks to j2 aka jared big thanks to julia w huge thanks to marissa lenti and amazingly huge thanks to Otaku Anthony, every one of you is absolutely awesome, and we really could not have gotten to 5,000 subscribers. We couldn't have gotten to anywhere without everyone's amazing support. And so with that, um, any, guys, do you have any final thoughts on this movie and the, the act of watching something that was really, really old for a change? Oh, I do that all the time. This isn't new for me. <laughs> I, like, I, like, I like old things. Anyone who's known me and spent more than five minutes around me knows that. I, I, I yeah. in, in all sincerity, it was really interesting to see something this old and kind of significant to uh, kind of the starting point of something that we all love here. So, you know, I'll, I take that away from this more than anything else. So, because I didn't really hate this all that much. I was just bored more than anything. <laughs> so, again, th- this it movie- made me want edibles. Well, what doesn't make you want edibles? Exactly. Discotech should put that on the back of the DVD. <laughs> it made me want edibles. Quote Spaceman, quote Hardy. Spaceman Hardy from Dub Talk. <laughs> it made me want edibles. End quote. <laughs> I'm sure not, even, not even Belladonna of Sadness can say that. <laughs> yeah. That's also on our maybe to watch list for later. But yes, I'm sure when the fine folks at Toei Animation made this all the way back in 1958, they were thinking about 2021 and wanting edibles while watching it. How do we get these kids on the reefer? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. All right. Well, anyways, thank you all very much. Have a wonderful day and otaku on, my friends. Get your Taku COVID on. shot. Amazing. Yes. Rock on Boston, rock on Get Chicago. your shoe shine box. <laughs> and keep it manly. Did you say get your shoe shine box? Yeah, it's from Goodfellas. I know what it's from. What does that have to do with this movie? <laughs> Because he said, get your COVID shot. I was just like, fine, I'll say this. <laughs> Alright, so Hardy, what, what was that kind of beer that you had again? Coors Light. Okay, just, uh... Yeah, you know, I'm not really much of a beer drinker, but you just go ahead and pass me, uh, pass me a little bit of that. I, I, I think I'm going to need it for this episode. Here you go. Thank you. Oh, yeah, it's good stuff. Maybe oh we God, should have connect- started on something different for the first episode of this. But <laughs> No, well, if I we think... Had a, if we had a cast list for A Thousand and One Nights, well, there you go. Oh, well. That would be... I mean, it was... Nobody, like, nobody wants to admit like that. that they were in that dub. That's the problem, so... <laughs> well, I got one actor uh, who's actually in this cast, so that's one. But, um, uh, yeah, we'd have to wait for the... Uh, see if uh, home video release for that movie had the cast list involved. I'm not sure if it did, actually. I don't think it does. I asked, uh, I think I asked Brainchild if it did, and she looked, and she couldn't find one. So. Yeah, she's the only one I know has a copy right now. Um, but I have one. I'll, I'll huh. look it through it and see if I can find it. Mm. Okay. Right. Oh but yeah, I, I definitely want to do that for a later episode. Um, yeah. This will just, I'm not going to watch the... it tonight. I'm not going to watch it tonight, though. You know what I'm going to watch after we're done here? Pootie Tang. What'd you say? Nothing. No, Pootie Tang as always. Pootie Tang's a turtle. No, I get to watch the giant bug porn movie. Mm. Fun. I- Island of Giant Spiders? 
Giant insects. Island of giant insects. Oh, giant insects. Okay, yeah. Oh. That dub is really funny, actually. I, wa whole, I watched yeah, a couple clips of it. It's actually really funny. So. All right. Well, I, I, I will let you off as soon as we're with this, and I promise we will be done within the hour. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs>